Caleb was a tribe leader and he was from the tribe of Judah. This is very interesting. He was a mighty warrior. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hember. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery, taking you through the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. We do that every year. Actually, for 33 years we've been doing that. Very exciting, Janice. Uh, okay, so we are going to be studying that in about, really, in about uh, five minutes. Right now, Corey is going to tell us what she's doing. I'm going to be taking a look at the floor plan of an ancient Israelite house. Ryan? Today I'm continuing my study on Joshua's long day. A lot of naturalistic theories have been proposed, but can any of them fully explain what happened? All right, very good. A house, really? Yes, there was kind of a model that all other houses were, were built around. It's quite significant. Very interesting. <laughs> okay, uh, Janice? Today she asked for water. All right, very good. So take your Bible guide out, turn to today's passage as we study this and look at it very carefully. Joshua 15, 12 through 19. The west border was the coastline of the Great Sea. This is the boundary of the children of Judah all around according to their families. Now to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he gave a share among the children of Judah according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, namely Kirjath Arba, which is Hebron. Arba was the father of Anak. Caleb drove out the three sons of Anak from there, Shishai, Ahiman, and Talmai, the children of Anak. Then he went up from there to the inhabitants of Deber. Formerly the name of Deber was Kirjath Sefer. And Caleb said, He who attacks Kirjath Sefer and takes it, to him I will give Aksa my daughter as wife. So Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, took it, and he gave him Aksa his daughter as wife. Now it was so, when she came to him, that she persuaded him to ask her father for a field. So she dismounted from her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you wish? She answered, Give me a blessing. Since you have given me land in the south, give me also springs of water. So he gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. Joshua chapter 15, verses 12 through 19. Joshua chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, and chapter 15. A lot of reading today as we go through the Bible. And it's important because we read a lot. When we look back, we can see moments where God seems to push forward his plans. For the land of Israel... God made his decision known at the time of Abraham several thousand years ago. Now, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your descendants I will give this land. Now, this decision was then fulfilled at the time of Joshua. Now, since Joshua, a lot of changes have happened to the land. Kings, exiles, power struggles, and even banishment after the time of Christ. And that is why it is so interesting today that we have witnessed the revival of God's prophesied word about the land of Israel. Zechariah 7. Israel is once again land-owning nation in the world. Modern Israel was even ranked as the fourth best performing economy in 2022 by The Economist. God is doing something very interesting for biblical prophecy in our time, isn't he? Perhaps we are living in one of those moments of God pushing his plans forward in a mighty way, just as the book of Joshua highlights for us in chapter 15. Let me tell you something. This is an exciting time to live. Oh, I know there's a lot of problems, but it's exciting, isn't it? We see things happening every day. Incredible. Today, Israel's borders. Joshua chapter 15, beginning with verse 12. You know, as we focus on this, 
I, I need us to pay attention to what God is doing because we need to see what his Bible says and we need to apply it to our hearts because that's very, very important. Turn in your Bible guide and Father, I pray today that you would help us to hear you. We need to take your word and we need to apply it to our heart. And this is what we ask, Father, that you would show us your ways and teach us your paths because we're living in a time that's very interesting and very prophetic right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And we said together, all of us, amen. I want to tell you, it's totally exciting. All right, chapter 15, verse 12 says, the west border, the borders of Israel, the west border was the coastline of the great sea. This is the boundary of the children of Judah all around according to their families. There it is. Judah is the tribe from which Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, came from. Now listen carefully. I'm just saying this, and this is true. We should be very alert toward Israel at this time. Now, the Economy magazine said, fourth most successful economy in the world. Let me tell you something, they're the superpower of the Middle East, I'm just saying that. We need to pay attention to what God is doing in Israel, because I'm telling you, this is Ezekiel 38. I don't want to get off on this, but that, we're, we're headed in that direction, and we're headed there fast. Very interesting. I'm very fascinated by this. Nevertheless, let's go on to chapter 15 of Joshua, verse 13 to 15. Let's look at this. Now to Caleb, the son of Jephmiah, he gave share among the children of Judah according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, namely Kerjath Ereba, which is Hebron. Ereba was the father of Anak. Caleb drove out the three sons of Anak from there, Shishai, Ahimam, and Talamai, the children of Anak. And then he went from there to the inhabitants of Deber. Formerly, the name of Deber was Kerjath Sephor. Now, we need to keep in mind that God is doing something very unique here. Caleb was from the tribe of Judah. Now, that's important because Jesus was too. He was a mighty man and a powerful warrior. We need to understand that. God calls us to his family. We are grafted into God's family family, beloved. We are grafted into God's family. And if you don't believe me, you can read Romans chapter 11, because that's not me talking. That's the Bible. A whole Holy Spirit, words of the Holy Spirit filling Paul. And let me tell you something, whatever you believe about the New Testament is whatever you believe it is, the word of God. The Bible consists of 66 books written by 40 authors over about 2000 years. Unbelievable. All right, let's get off on this now because this is good. This is chapter 15. Carefully read 16, 17, 18, and 19. Watch this. And Caleb said, He who attacks Kerjath Sephar and takes it to him, I will give Aksa, my daughter, as wife. So Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, took it and gave, he, Caleb gave him, Axia, his daughter, as wife. Now, it was so, when she came to him, that she persuaded him to ask her father for a field. I love this. This is awesome. So she dismounted from her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you wish? This mighty warrior of God. And she answered, Give me a blessing. Since you have given me land in, south, in the south, give me also springs of water. <laughs> so you know what? He gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. I'm telling you. You see, we need to pay attention. Caleb's nephew, Othniel, is introduced as a mighty man and a warrior. Now you can see Judges chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. <laughs> okay, this, this runs in the family, it seems. God has his will fulfilled in those who are called to his family. Are you called? 
I think you are. In fact, I think there's not a person listening to me today. And you might be the farthest in the furthest place away from God thinking you've done so much bad you can't do any worse. And you know what? God still called you. And you know what? God will still forgive you. And you know what? He'll still take you as his son. Come to Jesus Christ. Come to the Lord today. Say, Lord, I need you. Help me today. Jesus, I believe in you. I need your help. I am so far and I'm so ashamed of my sin. Forgive my heart and forgive me for the sin. I need you in my life today. I believe that you came and died on the cross, a bloody death. But three days later, you rose from the dead in the miracle of God. And you paid the cost of sin for me and gave me eternal life. Come into my heart today. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask you. And let's say it together. Amen. Make it so. You know, if you really prayed that prayer and you meant it, God will change you. It's time for us all to come home. It's time. Enough messing around. Let's all come back to Jesus. Come to the Lord because he's called you. Can you hear him? That's his voice. Hear him today. Well, it's time now to carry on with our Bible study. And my segment today is a continuation of yesterday's segment in which we talked about Joshua's long day. And that, of course, is recorded in Joshua chapter 10. And we concluded based upon the scripture that what occurred was not a natural event, but rather a supernatural one, perhaps maybe a halting of the Earth's rotation. We explored what sort of physical issues had to be overcome for that to happen. But of course, for a God who can create the entire heavens and earth, or cause a virgin to conceive, or raise the dead, such a miracle is nothing. Uh, nevertheless, many have been unwilling to accept this account straightforwardly, and so they've proposed alternative naturalistic explanations. So today, you and I are going to go through some of these explanations and see why they don't work. Although Joshua 10, 12 through 14, clearly reveals a very special and supernatural astronomical event, perhaps by the halting of Earth's rotation, for many this is too problematic. Hence various naturalistic explanations have been proposed. For example, some theorize that a total solar eclipse occurred, which helped to cool and refresh the Israeli troops. However, for a total solar eclipse to occur, the sun and moon must be at the same place in the sky. But the Bible clearly records that the sun and moon were at different locations. Furthermore, the Bible describes this unusual astronomical event as lasting about a whole day. But a total solar eclipse can last only a few minutes at most. Another similar idea is that a great cloud cover arose or some other darkening came up to give relief from the sun's heat. Not only is this idea not supported by the biblical text, but as also would be true for the solar eclipse theory, this would have benefited both sides of the battle but the Bible clearly indicates that only God's chosen people had the advantage. A third theory proposed is that some sort of strange refraction effect occurred, so that the sun continued to illuminate the battlefield, even though the sun had set. But in essence, this is really just exchanging one miracle for another, since such a refraction is not how the world normally operates. Those who seek a non-physical explanation claim that there was no miracle at all, but it just seemed as if one occurred. In other words, with God's help, the Israelites fought so well that it just seemed as if the day was extended. An even more liberal interpretation is that there was no miracle, nor was there even anything at all unusual about the battle that day. In fact, the entire passage is chalked up to poetic hyperbole. Proponents of this view compare Joshua 10, 12-14 to the Song of Deborah and Barak in Judges 5.20, 
where stars are described as fighting against Sisera. The main problem with this, however, is that while Judges 5 is clearly identified as poetry, Joshua 10 is not. Certainly it has a poetic element, but to claim that the entire passage is merely poetic hyperbole willfully ignores the rest of verses 13 and 14. Indeed, the second half of verse 13 rhetorically asks if this extraordinary day is not written in the book of Jasher. Furthermore, the second part of verse 13 goes on to use very literal, non-metaphorical language to state that the sun stopped in the middle of heaven and delayed setting for about a whole day. Additionally, the statement of verse 14 that there has been no day before or since like that one makes sense only if there was something truly remarkable about that day. As believers, we should bear in mind that God says what he means and means what he says. And if you cannot understand how this could have been done, remarked Martin Luther, then grant the Holy Spirit the honor of being more learned than you are. For you are to deal with scripture in such a way that you bear in mind that God himself says what is written. But since God is speaking, it is not fitting for you wantingly to turn his word in the direction you wish it to go. You know, as a final note, the, some of the same scholarship that claims that the biblical account of Joshua's long day was merely poetic hyperbole also claims the same about the creation count in Genesis. See, like Joshua 10, Genesis also has some poetic elements. Uh, for example, in Genesis 2.23, Adam gets pretty romantic when he sees Eve for the very first time. And he says, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. But you know, just as with Joshua, to claim that the creation account is nothing more than poetic hyperbole is to willfully ignore the rest of the account, which is clearly historical narrative. And if you think that it's silly to accept Genesis as actual literal history, then I recommend reading the opinions of other biblical persons like Peter, Paul, and Jesus. And make no mistake, both Genesis and Joshua are very important history. Yeah, it really is important to remember that Peter, James, and Jesus, they also talk about this and they say, you know what, uh, the beginning was this and Jesus says the beginning was male, female, and you know, I mean, you can't get around it. No, it's very, very, very true. Very interesting. Okay, Corey? All right. Well, covered in our reading today is the allotments of land that the Israelites were given as they went into the promised land. So they begin to conquer, and now what? Where are they going to settle? Where are they going to go? How are they going to divide it up by tribes? That's all taken care of here in these chapters of Joshua. And that got me thinking about homes and what they would have begun to have built uh, as they were settling in Canaan. Uh, and archaeologically speaking, there was a type of Israelite house. It's referred to as the four-room house. So let's take a look at some scholarship that has proposed explanations for why this became the standard model of an Israelite home well into the time period of the kings. Take a look. In the field of biblical archaeology, there's an interesting peculiarity that helps define the cities and lands where Israelites lived, a type of house. From the 12th to the 6th centuries BC, called the Iron Age, there was a common floor plan used in most homes throughout the land. Biblically, this represents the time period of the late judges through the entire period of the kings until the Babylonian destruction of 586 BC. The type of house is called the four-room house because of its layout. It had three long rooms and one broad room that stretched across the front or back of the house. The three long rooms could be divided by walls or by columns, and any of the rooms could be subdivided into smaller spaces. Many researchers think that the middle room was often open to the sky to act as a type of courtyard, and the houses could also have a second floor and a flat roof that could act as a sort of ancient balcony or outdoor living space. Interestingly, this basic four-room design can also be seen reflected in some monumental buildings, like forts, administrative and public buildings, and likely because of its common use as a home in life, the design can also be seen mirrored in some tombs. There are many theories trying to explain where the four-room house could have come from, like borrowing from Canaanite architecture, growth out of nomadic tent life, or a novel invention of the early Israelites. 
Due to its rather sudden appearance and that it dominates all of the areas the Bible ascribes to Israel, including east of the Jordan, the land of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, it seems most likely that the house plan was an Israelite invention. It's been argued by researchers that it must have been developed specifically for function. The home had to be a place for food processing, crafting daily use articles, storage, and a place to sleep for both people and animals. With the addition of a second floor and roof, there could be dedicated spaces for eating and resting. But the purpose had to be more than function, because the floor plan also dominated homes with different needs within the walled cities of Israel. This has caused researchers to look for something else that is uniquely Israelite, mainly the Law of Moses. It's been noted that a unique feature of the four-room house is its potential privacy. One central room can access all other rooms in the house rather than having to walk through several rooms to get to your destination. This is significant because it would have helped to uphold the purity laws in the Bible. When a member of the household became ceremonially unclean, they could spend their time at home without interfering with the daily flow of life, without people having to pass through their space and also risk becoming ceremonially unclean. It has also been noted that having homes that facilitated this would have actually helped pass the laws on to the next generation. It was quite literally built into the fabric of their society. Now, one of the reasons why I find this study so interesting is because if that's true, that the, the structure of the Israelite four-room house was constructed to help facilitate the laws of Moses, the purity laws that we've just read about in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, this is very interesting to me because the whole purpose of the Mosaic Law, according to chapters like Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20, was to make sure that Israelite culture was distinct from the pagan cultures that surrounded her. It, it made Israel stand out. Uh, and this was for the purpose of God, you know, bringing his plan of salvation to fruition. He needed a nation that stood apart. But what makes that really interesting is that then it's still doing that. The four room house still identifies for us archeologically that this was an Israelite settlement. It makes Israelite sites stand out from the other cultures of the day, along with another purity law that forbade the eating of pork. You know, the absence of pig bones uh, is another very good indicator of an Israelite site, archeologically speaking. So the law that the Israelites followed is still distinguishing them for us today. Yeah, very good, Corey. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. Janice? She asked for water. And that made me think of something, and maybe you're already knowing where I'm going with this point. Caleb's daughter, Axa, asks her father for springs of water, and this request would increase her dowry to receive a full inheritance that included the necessary water sources for land to be usable in the Judean desert. Now, that reminds me that Jesus is our living water. Remember what he said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. We need Jesus in our lives to be sustainable in this world that we live. We cannot do it on our own, try as we might. We need that wonderful living water that Jesus offers. Remember the woman? The Samaritan woman who came to the well and Jesus asked her for a drink. It's in John chapter four. If I don't have time to go through it all right now, a woman of Samaria came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The woman of Samaria said to him, how is it you being a Jew? Ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. 
But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. This simple request of Aksa to her father, Caleb, and Caleb gave it to her, gave her what she needed to sustain what she had inherited while she was in this Judean desert in the land. I would submit that living in this world, and I've already said it, but I'm gonna say it again, living in this world, we can try to do it on our own, but we will fail. We need Jesus in our lives. He is our living water. He is the bread of life. We bring this program to you, giving you the word of God so that we can learn together from this living water, that we can have Jesus Christ living in our hearts and helping us with the things that we go through in this life. Some good, some not so good, but you know what? God is always with us. He will see us through. Isn't that yeah, true, Rod? It is true. And, and I just want to say that, uh, and, and this is something that we need to say. We don't say it very often, but we have a prayer meeting that goes on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 3.30. And we want to encourage people, uh, if you can make time, uh, to come to the prayer meeting on YouTube, on Facebook, or Bible Discovery TV. And we'll pray for your needs and we'll uh, update you on all the things going on because that's very, very important. So keep that in the back of your mind. So when you're thinking and you're on the computer, oh yeah, 3.30, come on over to Facebook, YouTube, or Bible Discovery and we'll be there. Thank you for joining us today. Great to have you with us. And as we continue on, I wanna say that if you go to YouTube and search Pastor Rod Hembry, then you'll find a place where we put Beyond the Call. It's a program featuring the testimonies of people. What a great place this is. And so you can get those programs and watch them too. But right now, let's pray. Lord, help me to fulfill what you have planned for my life. Help me today. Amen.